This conference will now be recorded. All right, so in yesterday's class, we were discussing about what are the different applications of data science, how data science is used in different industry verticals, uh, which are which are the areas it is touching upon and we also discussed about some general topics about what are the uh, basic requirements for doing a data science uh, how to shift to a data science so all those things we discussed today i'll be talking about an interesting topic uh, i'll be using uh, my whiteboard so i'll be talking about an interesting topic of uh, how we can uh, how we can see an end to end data science pipeline in real world what are the different areas which are involved in creating an entire data science pipeline and which are the job roles like if you are from a specific background what are the job roles which are required you know for someone to uh, you know understand so all those things we would be discussing in this particular um, section so if you understand data science is nothing but you're trying to operate on data now where is this data coming from is a question now operation on this data is the data is coming from multiple places so the first and foremost application areas which bring data now the first and foremost application areas which bring data are your databases now i can create it like a a table kind of a structure i can say databases in the yesterday session we were discussing that most of our data you know you will be storing it in the databases if it is a regular business company or an organization most of the data will be stored in this databases typically these are called as uh, ods operational data stores or operational data storage uh, stores what these operational data stores what they do is they will be typically rdbms da databases now i can just write rdbms but they can all they can uh, be any rdbms it can be oracle databases it can be mysql postgres databases or it can be any such kind of databases where your data will be created your data will be actually imported from your front end systems so you would be having an application Say like a you know a, a form kind of an application where you have a laptop and the customers basically feed in the data to the databases now this is like a front-end application i'm trying to create these front-end applications basically are you know mastered by your regular devil uh, your regular employees who will be entering some information if it is a retail company they'll be entering the details about customers and all that stuff uh, if it is a banking company they'll be entering the details about uh, bank transactions and all that stuff so all those details will be entered into these rdbms databases so once the databases are formed then we will try to uh, apply our data analysis on top of it in the earlier days as as i was discussing what we were happening was these databases we used to run direct queries on these databases but the problem what happened is you know because these databases are are linked with the front end systems the performance of the databases was degrading and uh, because of that what happened is people thought that let us not put the put, let us not run the queries in the daytime let us run the query in the nighttime that was the thought process so so slowly the systems became something called as batch processes now batch processes are nothing but you are trying to create uh, nightly jobs where instead of in the morning the transactions are happening but in the night you will try to run the jobs on this to analyze your data that was happening but in the later days you know because the systems were becoming more global and uh, systems were also operated in throughout 24 cross 7 then uh, even running the jobs in the night time was getting difficult. That's where your data warehouses came into picture. Now data warehouses, what they did is, instead of the prime databases, we tried to replicate into another databases, which uh, you would do some transformations and apply 
some uh, uh, some um, basic systems so i can i can say like you created a storage and then you try to bring in the data to these data warehouses now i can say that dwh sorry what they did is they try to bring in the data to these data warehouses and the data warehouses will apply some uh, transformation of your data now you create another tables you could do transformation and do other stuff where you're trying to operate on your uh, data you try to uh, join multiple tables uh, of your front end systems and then trying to create more transformed data and all that stuff so all those you you do it at this place but later what happened is instead of these are uh, real time data sources you know people also were trying to create a lot of other kind of uh, systems like for example there were um, there were uh, real time uh, feed systems for example i can see like real time feeds the you know, feed scheme there are some log files and they want to put all these log files feeds and probably images right some random images all those things we are trying to put it into this particular data warehouse so technically what happened is these data warehouses were not able to um so technically what happened is these data warehouses primarily they are designed for your front end uh, rdbms kind of data transformations but when these other types of data was coming up for example feeds log files images uh, maybe i can take another thing like uh, sensor data right i'm just trying to create a representation so sensor data and so on so we are trying to feed a lot of these information and we would like to have a data source which is basically uh, doing the storage of all uh, all kind of uh, data formats that's when what happened is these data warehousing solutions we have changed it to something we can call it as data lakes now they have become something called as data lakes so for many years you know data warehousing solutions were used where uh, you know they were storing these uh, normal rdbms kind of a data into a separate file file system the reports were running here you were running some uh, you know transformations you are running some queries uh, so you can run reports you can run uh, queries um, you know transformation and um, you know graphs joins right so these are all things could be run on your data warehousing solutions but because now all these other kind of data formats are coming up uh, people what they have now created is called as data lakes now the first step whatever we are understanding when my data is stored at different places i need to bring this data onto these data lakes now data lakes are nothing but a storage place where we are gathering all these information so it could be uh, real time data from the databases or it could be some uh, third party feed information it could be some system log files operational log files uh, some performance log files all those things some images videos and uh, some tape based devices audio based uh, systems all those things will be coming here some uh, iot based sensor devices or their sensor information all those things can also come 
So what we are seeing is we are having different kinds of systems which are getting collaborated at one single place and typically those are called as data lakes. Now these data lakes, now data lakes, now they are being constructed on cloud devices. Now I can say we are constructed on AWS based cloud or Azure or GCP. Are you understanding? So these data lakes, whatever we call, which are like a combination of uh, places where we are trying to do some transformations, trying to create reports, queries, graphs, and so on. All those data uh, lakes, you know, consist of multiple file systems. Uh, there will be multiple files, and you will be having different folder structure for those files. And we are using currently, we are using something called as uh, cloud-based systems like AWS or Azure or GCP. I am very, uh, I have a good experience in AWS, so I would be talking on the AWS front. Uh, in AWS, we have something called as S3. So we have something called as S3, which is called as simple storage service, where we will, we will, we will get all these data files and then we'll store it in that particular place. Uh, so that is called as S3, which is, uh, which is a place where you can create subfolders for all these uh, data files and formats and then bring all the data here for doing something called as your data transformation. Now, if you are seeing here where we are constructing all these things, we need to ensure that the data which is stored here has to be available 24 cross 7. Uh, it should have all the storage capacity. It should be able to, it should be, it should get all the uh, computational power for running some reports or creating some graphs or uh, doing some analysis. All those things we should have full capability of. So there is a lot of job requirement here where we are trying to uh, create the systems doing the data ingestion. This is the ingestion collection place like where we're collecting the data. So there are tools like Scoop, which is collecting your data from your databases to your systems. Uh, typically these systems could be, uh, you know, Hadoop systems or cloud-based systems. But we are, what we are doing is we are trying to collect your data to a centralized place where all the data is storing at that place and then we are trying to uh, provide some uh, details right so feeds and log files there are some tools like kafka there's something like flume um, we also have um, you know aws related tools like kinesis Now, what are these tools? These are the tools which are helping to bring in the log data, the log data from the feeds or log files or system format files and all those files. We're trying to bring in all this data. Uh, is there a question? Okay. So we're trying to bring in all the data. So if you guys have a question, I would request to post that on the chat window. So that will help uh, me to look at the question and then answer as and when I'm talking about some topic. So it would be covered. All right. So the feed data and log file data and other kind of data, you would be using these tools like Kafka, Flume, Kinesis, and all those things to get into the data for uh, maybe like sensor information, image-based processes, images and all, probably you might use some FTP, uh, FTP-based solutions uh, where you're trying to, uh, you know, transfer your files from uh, maybe a different Unix server to your uh, data lakes so that all your images or videos or any other files will be coming back to your systems. So this area of doing all these kind of uh, you know, doing loading all these kind of information typically is called as data engineering. This is a purpose data engineering. Now, what is the data engineering? It is basically the area in which we are trying to gather a lot of information. You are trying to do a transformation. Uh, this particular place where we are gathering information, we are calling it as data ingestion. We are trying to ingest the data into a system. So we're trying to gather it at one place and we can use it for doing some analysis, 
right? So older data warehouses are transformed into something called as data lakes, and we are trying to create these data lakes where I can store all the data. And the entire process of ensuring that the data lakes are available 24 cross 7. Uh, so there will be some admin related activities here. There will be some cloud related activities here. Um, and there will be some ingestion related activities. So the people who will be working here will be called as data engineers. They might have experience in data ingestion tools like Scoop, Kafka, Loom, or some of the Unix based file system, file transformations, and all. They might be having experience on admin related tools like, you know, you, you might be a Hadoop admin, you might be a data admin or system admin who would be setting up these systems either on premise or on the cloud. If you are a, working on a cloud based provider, probably you would be working on AWS cloud or Azure or GCP. You might have to set these pipelines. You might have to ensure that storage is available so that all these files are coming up and during there and you don't have any problem of uh, data transformations on that. Right, so the job profiles, whichever uh, fall under this category, we call it as data engineering category where you do all this engineering part, uh, setting up the systems and so on, right? So the technologies whichever uh, are used in this particular section, so I already listed out a couple of them, uh, but some of others are Hadoop. You might have to learn about a little bit of Hadoop. Uh, there's, um, there's something like Spark. Uh, so big data, whatever people call, that is the, the section here, big data. Uh, you might also need to understand about you know scoop and other things probably another tools like hive uh, these are some of the other tools which are used for some of the processing right so these are the ones which are you know loading your data keeping it ready uh, ensuring that your 24 cross 7 uh, availability is there and you have infinite storage of storage space and so on so this is the first section of our uh, data analysis the next section of your data analysis forms under something what you call as data exploratory data analysis. It's called as exploratory Now, what is the exploratory data analysis? It is also called as EDA in short term. Now, whenever I got this data, now I got data from log files, feeds, images, and all this information. Now, when I got all these data, now I have to ensure that the data is proper, the data does not have any missing values, the data is uh, you know, easily consumable, there is no garbage values, it is properly cleaned, so all these things uh, has to be understood from the data. So you would use some tools like, um, you know, Pandas, NumPy, Matplotlib, Seaborn. These are some of the libraries which will be helping us to analyze this data from your database. So your input for the exploratory data analysis, EDA, will be the data lakes where you will be getting your data from. And those data lakes, Uh, those data lakes uh, just a second I'm just hearing some background noise <clears throat> okay let me good so exploratory data analysis where we are trying to see that exploratory data analysis uh, you would need to do something called as missing value imputation right missing value imputation so many a times what happens is not all your data is having proper information so you might have to treat something like missing values uh, you might have to do something like uh, scaling you might have to do something called as encoding so encoding is like basically converting your categorical variables into numerical variables so all of your machine learning process would work on numerical data numbers so if there are any uh, different type of data types, you might have to approach it in a different way. You have to do some kind of transformation. Uh, you also can do transformation. 
right? You have to do something called as normalization. But there are different techniques. So what I'm trying to talk here is we are trying to do some different techniques. Normalization. Like what we are doing is we're doing different kinds of techniques here, uh, like scaling, encoding, transformation, normalization, standardization. So all those different techniques are there where we are trying to uh, look at the data and then from the data, we are trying to get meaningful information. If you're not extracting that meaningful information, what happens is your data would be full of garbage. So this particular step is called as data cleaning or cleansing, different names are there. But we are trying to ensure that we are doing the proper, uh, you know, cleaning of your data, ensuring that uh, non-value added information is removed from the data. So only value added information is present. So the key here is if you are uh, giving garbage in, if you're giving garbage in, you get garbage out. Right? As simple as it. So you're giving garbage in into your data, you are going, going to get garbage out. So your machine learning model, however powerful it be, uh, if, if, if at all you're giving garbage data, you're putting like plenty of information to the data, then what happens is you are most probably going to get a garbage data. So as a, as a practical example, let me talk about it. For example, you wanted to create a machine learning application where you are trying to predict whether the person will get a loan or not. So that is a very simple machine learning application you are trying to create. Now, as a part of that, you are trying to talk to the bank uh, to gather a lot of information about the customer's loan process. For example, you're collecting past five years of customer data. So the data, customer data, whatever we have is we have a lot of information about customers. What is the customer's salary, customer's uh, bank balance, uh, for the past six months, uh, probably you are having information about the customer, like what are his spending habits, uh, average weekly spending, then maybe uh, current uh, other loans he or she has, uh, the the marital status of the person, uh, the current uh, uh, whether he has he or she has any kids or not, and uh, different other uh, information which are required for your your bank loan. Apart from all these information, you might also have a lot of other information because these banks, what they do is they collect all the information from the customer. All the information, for example, general information like the name of the customer, email address of the customer, phone number of the customer, the likes of the customer, dislikes of the customer, uh, and different other things, right? For example, if my phone number is a fancy number, like double line, double line, double line, something like that, you have a very fancy number, uh, is there a likelihood that you get a better loan? Do you think that you get a better loan if you have a fancy phone number? No, right? So you, you don't get a better loan. Imagine you create a very fancy email address or anything other like, for example, your name is like Shah Rukh Khan. Uh, are you going to get a better loan? No, right? So, so there could be a lot of these data points which are regularly used in the customer data collection, like phone number, email address, a lot of other things like address, uh, some you know preference of certain things. Like for example, would you like to get emails? Uh, would you like to uh, you know would would you like to get your uh, pay slips or not the not the pay slips, the account statements uh, to your email or not? Some general preferences. Uh, your information about some FDs and other stuff. So all those things typically what happens is they are we can call them as non-value added data points. So all those non-value non added data points have to be removed from your entire data processing. There could be also some columns which are having high correlations. So in exploratory data analysis what we do is we try to do this uh, relational mapping that we are trying to an analyze like how your input data points are uh, correlated. So if you understand that the data points are very highly correlated, you can use that correlation for predicting uh, what is going to happen in the future. Either we can uh, you know, consider only one value and work on that, or you can consider both of them and then use it for, for the processing. So in the exploratory data analysis, we do a lot, use a lot of uh, techniques, for example, uh, you use something like NumPy, you use something like Pandas. 
And this I'm talking about from a Python perspective, we have other tools also, but NumPy, Pandas, your Matplotlib, your Seaborn. These are some of the libraries which we need to know for performing the exploratory data analysis, right? So once we perform the exploratory data analysis, we get something called as a clean data. So the clean data will be fed into your machine learning process. Now I can talk about the next area, uh, which is like machine learning. So the next area is machine learning, where we're trying to do a lot of algorithmic process. Now here comes a lot of your uh, algorithms. Again, machine learning forms under classification and regression uh, cases. There are plenty of different uh, methods which are used for finding the machine learning process. Uh, but you would be getting some using some popular algorithms like K nearest neighbors. You can use something like random forest. You can use something like um, you know XGBoost. Mm, support vector machine, neural networks. These are some of the algorithms. I'm just, I'm just listing a couple of them. There are plenty of algorithms which are used in the machine learning process. And in the machine learning process, what we're trying to do is we're trying to feed some of the data. Typically, we apply a lot of techniques in which we are trying to uh, do data processing, where we are removing, uh, where we taking your input data, trying to divide into training and testing, and different processes will be there, and then applying a machine learning process. So this machine learning process is an iterative process. Iterative process in sense, you're trying to run in loops. The, re the reason this machine learning process is an iterative process is because the first time when we are using any of the algorithm, we are trying to get some accuracy then we try to improve the accuracy of the machine learning model by doing some hyperparameter tuning, by providing some more input data, by fine tuning some of the parameters and so on and so forth. We are trying to do some of your uh, data processing techniques in which we are trying to improve the accuracy of your machine learning model. And then using that machine learning model, we are trying to uh, build a better model of your uh, data or better model of your algorithm and then once this better model is created, you try to push that better model into the next stage. So generally what, what happens is most of the people only talk till this point, like they will talk about, okay, machine learning is there. So we are trying to use some model, for example, say random forest model, and then you're getting like say 70% accuracy or 80% accuracy. Then you say your machine learning is done. Your deep learning data science is done but that is not done. That is only half of the entire process, whatever we do in the real world, right? So machine learning, getting up, applying an algorithm and uh, you know, uh, getting an accuracy is just one small part of your entire equation. We have to do even beyond that. So for example, once we get your machine learning processing, you have to apply that, uh, maybe uh, you know, deploy that onto another cloud-based provider, for example, I would uh, deploy that onto a AWS cloud. So we have to deploy these machine learning model, whatever you're creating into an AWS cloud. So you might have to uh, do the deployment. And you know, once you are deploying that into an AWS cloud as a model, now you can create a kind of a wrapper on top of it. Like a wrapper is like an API. Now this is running on AWS cloud. Imagine you're running on a Linux machine. So which is running a Linux machine on an AWS cloud. A deployment would require a lot of other tools which have to be learned here. For example, there are tools like Flask. There's, there's understanding of, uh, you know, Git. There's understanding of uh, Docker. 
the understanding of Kubernetes. I hope you are able to read these Kubernetes. So the deployment is the process you are trying to uh, do the deployment. Let me erase this. Kubernetes are right here. Right, so we have uh, Kubernetes, a uh, Flask, or Git, or Docker. These kind of important things have to be understood in this deployment phase. We are trying to deploy your machine learning model, whatever is the model. We're trying to deploy onto a cloud, say like AWS cloud or something. And uh, here you might run in uh, a Docker-based container, or you might run an ECS uh, Elastic Cloud machine, or like a virtual machine on the cloud, to which you are uh, you are having a front end application connected so you might have a front end application connected and the front end application might be collecting some information and then trying to have some kind of a button for example the bank application whatever i am talking that could be a front-end application which can be developed in different languages. We'll talk about that. Now, there is a front-end application which is which is actually accessing this endpoint, and we are trying to create this front-end application. The front-end application again can be created in um, any of the front-end technologies. That could be Angular. It could be React. It could be Flask. Um, it could be um, any other front-end application. There are a lot, lot of JS applications, maybe or Java also, right? A front-end application which is created by your front-end systems where you are accessing this endpoint. Uh, you're accessing this endpoint. So what is this endpoint? Endpoint is the endpoint of your model, uh, which is accepting some inputs. If I'm taking the same bank application, if I take the inputs are, what is your salary? What is the age of the person, uh, your bank balance, your marital status, uh, you know, current loans. Imagine these are five, six inputs of your application. So you have to enter all these inputs. So you enter that what is your name, what is your age, uh, what is your current salary, what are the, what is the bank balance for the past six months, and uh, maybe like average bank balance. And then you would uh, enter if you are having any other loans and uh, whether you are married, if you have any uh, kids, dependencies like that, and then you say submit. So when you click this red submit button, what happens is it, it internally calls this API, internally calls this API, passes all this information to the API. API will be having this model deployed that will be uh, processing your data and then sending back the result to your friend application. So what happens, your friend application will be showing that congratulations, you are loan is approved and uh, you are approved for 5 lakh 20 thousand of the loan amount are we understanding so there the process in which we are trying to understand is we are trying to say like we are creating your application in such a way that your 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 model whatever is created in the machine learning process that model is deployed onto a third party cloud or maybe on an on premise device where you're creating your wrapper endpoint on top of it, which is accepting inputs and outputs. And you can call that wrapper from another front-end application, Angular, React, Flask, Java, any other front-end application, which will be calling, calling that API endpoint. And then you will be giving the input parameters for that uh, front-end application. And uh, you will be collecting the you know, prediction from the model and then showing it back in the application. Are we uh, are we getting it? Is it is it? Uh, are we understanding, guys? Yes, sir. So there's a question like API endpoint is nothing but a Python model algorithms. Yes. So what we do is uh, your Python you have to create it like a wrapper, right? So that I accept your inputs and give my outputs. So uh, understanding is that you can create the wrapper using uh, any uh, API 
kind of a thing, right? So we try to create this API endpoint um, where I can uh, call this model and you can call it from your front-end application and that will show your result as well. For example, here in you go to icica.com, something like that, and you are trying to apply for a loan. So you are trying to give all the details like what whatever your personal details and then say click apply button. So this is like icica.com website. You are giving all the details and clicking the button, red button. It will call the API endpoint, provide all the details and then get the prediction. So this application which is running on the AWS cloud will run the prediction. The step is called as inference. The step is called as inference where we are trying to infer your uh, a, a, you know, prediction data and that inference will give you a prediction. So that prediction will be again showed on the front end application. In this, I am only showing the like entry point, but after you click this apply button, you will get another new page where you'll be showing congratulations, you are approved for the loan and your loan amount is 5 lakh 20,000 or something like that. Are we understanding? So that is how your, uh, your data, data will be flowing. That is how your uh, prediction will happen and the prediction results will be shown on the front end application. Got it. So technology requirements for the again front end applications could be different. It could be somebody who is also doing same Python based Flask applications, web applications. It could also be Django. Okay, I forgot to write it. Um, so it could also be something called as Django. Uh, D J A N G O. Right, Django based applications. So there could be any number of applications which are used for creating front end. But once I create that front end application, it can invoke this and then get, get the results. All right. So once this is done, so you are using Google Colab. Google Colab could be used, but the so what we do is we will uh, once we have to do the deployment, you have to create it more like an uh, executable or like a uh, we, we generally call it as a pickle files so we have to create it as an executable so that you can send your outputs uh, to your to your data and to your uh, to your applications so so there is a question like for example um front end code has two things ui and the server in case you call the python code algorithms from the java api yes if at all your entire code front end instance i'm saying that the entire application both front end uh, ui and the back end i'm not talking about the html ui code i'm talking about the the, the back end part you know in fact which is calling your uh, you know back end uh, uh, uis so it could be uh, again node.js or uh, anything right so those all uh, things whichever do the back end calling that will be calling your python apis python apis which will be doing the method invocation for the model and get back you the results understood guys Right now, I can write my front end code in any way. Uh, the way it is doing the back end invocation, right? So I have a back end code. It could be written in Node.js or Python or Java or any other thing. And that calls my API, which is running on a different uh, Linux server, and that is going to be um, that is going to be um, having all these uh, details. The next thing, uh, this is good part. The next part is now many a times you also have uh, maybe systems like you would like to have a visualization system. So you can create a data visualization system. I can call data visualization. For the data visualization systems, what happened is they would like to show some graphs, like uh, what has already happened, what is going to happen, like futuristic graphs. Uh, from machine learning, we will be able to get that futuristic predictions, like forecasting and so on and so forth. 
Now, the people will also expect to show some graphs, like senior officials, they would like to see some, you know, trend or graph or uh, maybe like, uh, you know, forecast of what is going to happen in the future, you know, whether the sales will increase or decrease, if it, they decrease, how much they can go down. So all these things uh, would be required to be, um, you know, shown in some kind of data visualization formats. So here is where your data visualization tools uh, come into uh, play. So there are some important tools like Tableau. Uh, we have uh, Power BI. Um, like click view. So Tableau, Power BI, click view uh, and different other uh, tools, third party tools are there, which are uh, helping for creating these data visualization techniques or data visualization techniques will be helpful in creating the views of, of your analysis. Now you're trying to do some analysis, you're trying to do some predictions, you're trying to do some recommendations or uh, forecasting. Now all those uh, forecasting recommendations and all those things have to be uh, visualized in some way so that uh, pictures will give more meaningful information. Um, so that meaningful information can be provided by the data visualization tools. And these are some of the tools which are required. Tableau, Power BI, Click View, and all that stuff. Now, one more or another important thing is, now this is more like a real-time front-end system. This is more like a visualization, but there will be another process which is which is uh, basically like a batch process. Now they can create something called as a batch process. Now, what is the batch process? For example, uh, if uh, somebody is entering into IICICA.com and then entering all the details and clicking the apply button, he will get a recommendation saying that your loan is approved. But imagine bank people want to give 100 uh, applications and they want to know the uh, approval or rejection, rejection prediction for those 100 applications. Then they what they will do is they will give the entire data in a uh, one one go in a batch process. So you imagine they will give it 100 applications in one go. So when they give 100 applications in one go, we have to uh, take every application, then call my machine learning model in a loop. So basically, I will also be invoking this machine learning process, but that will be in a batch mode. So input for that batch mode would be a file. Imagine that would be an input input uh, csv file input for that batch process will be a csv file and then output for that model will also be a csv file you're understanding now instead of you know a person individually clicking in an online mode what they're doing right now is they are bank people are giving some record bulk records so bulk records are being given the so 100 100 uh, um, you know 100 customer details who are applying for the loan or like 1000 customer details who are applying for the loan so this batch process what it will do is inter instead of doing a direct inferences we try to do batch inferences typically these processes will run in the uh, late night in the night you would be scheduling this process so it will picking up from input file from another cloud storage so from the data lakes you would be you know, i can draw a link like this but it will you know mess up your entire diagram but just imagine that this input file is coming from your cloud data lakes so it will come from the data lake it will invoke a batch process so this is a nightly batch process or maybe a weekly batch process which is invoked and what it will do is internally call your machine learning models maybe the machine learning model already deployed here so you would uh, use that deployed machine learning model and run the batch process and then you get an output file and it will get an output file. So you are in giving an input file, this batch process is happening. Imagine 100 employees are being, uh, 100 customers records you want to predict whether they want to, whether you have to give loans for them or not. So you predict those 100 employees and uh, you run the batch process and then you get back your output file. 
output file will have all the details maybe like customer id or something like that will be a key and it will have the approval status and probably also have the approval loan amount so we'll say like customer one two three four five uh, loan is approved uh, approval loan amount is still like fifty thousand something like that uh, uh, um, customer id some other number will have uh, rejected and you will not have any loan amount so what we are trying to see is we are trying to create an entire end-to-end -end process in which we are trying to um, uh, trying to produce uh, your full uh, understanding of uh, of your data process where we are trying to create this entire batch process where your batch process is uh, creating these uh, different uh, results and uh, it will uh, produce your output results so here again here we would need to understand uh, things like how do we create um, you know automated batch processes you know some requirements like tools like autosys or uh, tools like you know data pipeline creations some cloud specific tools need to be known here um, there are also some devops tools for example jenkins which are required here to understand you might need to understand about some linux projects You need to understand about some Linux process, uh, some batch jobs. You need to require these all different understanding, right? So once you do this kind of understanding where we are triggering these batch jobs on maybe like a cron step where you're running these jobs, the job will be running every day. So every day in the night, 12 o'clock, the batch uh, job runs. It will take the input file it will check whether the file is available or not it will take that input file and apply the machine learning model uh, get the output results and then create an output file imagine the batch run batch job runs for one hour so from 12 o'clock in the night to one o'clock in the night the batch job runs by one o'clock your output file will be created and that output file will again be stored in the data lake right? it will again back be stored in the data lake so your input file will come from data lake your output file will also uh, go to the data lake but this is how your entire uh, you know batch process can be working now uh, what what i'm trying to bring in here is uh, people only stop here so they might be writing some jupyter notebook uh, based code or probably on google collab they'll be showing some uh, you know accuracy 50 percent 60 percent they'll be sh showing some metrics um, related to accuracy precision recall curves and so on but that is only the the machine learning part of it but when you are seeing it also covers a lot of other uh, kind of moving parts understood so these moving parts so this particular area where you are talking about uh, doing data exploited data analysis apply machine learning models this entire stuff we can derive into something called as data science we can derive into the data science area this job of you know deploying the models and all those things uh, typically will be done by a machine learning engineer ml engineer right and ml engineer will be working on this area and data visualization engineer will be working on creating the data reports there could be again ml engineer here could be working on the batch process this could also be done by ml engineer because he he will have different kind of skill sets he will have a combination of machine learning skill set and also the the devops skill set a little bit of devops skill set like how to do the deployment how to uh, create the model and do all that stuff and so on so that your entire uh, process would be working uh, normal right now when coming to the job roles like what are the different job roles which will be available in the data engineering part as i told job roles will be you know how to set up the systems how to create the storage systems how to do the data ingestion all that so big data related job roles will be there how do related job roles will be there spark and hive spark would be uh, a pre-processing technique in which we can do some transformations right at the data lakes so we could uh, apply some Spark jobs, uh, some Spark SQL, Spark uh, ML, and uh, basic Spark jobs will be there. Either they could be Python Spark or Scala Spark. 
and those jobs will be there to uh, work on these transformations. You could also apply some hive jobs where you can uh, do some transformations on the data. And uh, this part, you would be getting a lot of jobs here on uh, on these all technologies. And uh, the next area, you would you would need to have a good understanding of data science, like how we would use all these tools, how we would apply all these algorithms. So proper data scientists will be working in this space. So either a junior data scientist or a senior data scientist would be working in this space. He would be doing a lot of data pre-processing, creating good amount of data, identifying things like data drift, model drift, uh, applying uh, different algorithms, uh, doing hyperparameter tuning. All those things will be done here uh, for creating a better prediction models. So yesterday we were looking at some applications, but whatever I'm talking is like real time, uh, you know, work like how everybody would be doing the work. So here, data scientists would be working here, junior data scientist or senior data scientist. And the last part we were just discussing about ML engineers who will be, uh, they will be having an overlap of machine learning and your DevOps part. They will be doing both of them. Uh, they will be having DevOps, cloud and machine learning combination. So they will be uh, deploying, they might be having understanding of Kubernetes or Docker or Flask and they'll be helpful in, helpful in deploying the models where a data scientist might be purely applying algorithms. They might be doing some research on the algorithms, creating better algorithms and models. Uh, those all stuff would be done by data scientists. Uh, ML engineers will be more or less like deploying the models, creating your models. All those things will be done by your ML engineers. And then uh, you might be required front-end engineers uh, who would be knowing like Java, Angular, React, Node.js, Django, or any of those technologies uh, to, to invoke or create your front-end applications which can invoke your APIs. So this is another job requirement uh, for a data science team, right? So they, there will be one or two engineers who will be doing front-end applications. Uh, if, the, if the application is very big, you might also have UX engineers who can design your uh, you know, uh, UX pages, uh, look and feel of the pages, uh, front ends and so on. All those things will be doing that work. And your data visualization engineers will also be required where you might have one or two people who will be doing Tableau, Power BI, ClickView, like one of these technologies and who will be, uh, you know, loading data from your outputs of the machine learning models, which could be some batch reports and then using them for output prediction. That could be forecasting your data, sales, information, profit, all those things can be forecasted using that. Uh, and again, ML engineers they just discussed that batch processes could be used. They might also have some kind of understanding of batch oriented process, like how do you create these Jenkins jobs, uh, which could be triggered every day in the night and picking up your machine learning model, applying that model and you know running that, right? Above and beyond these all the stuff, you will also, automate your machine learning process because this is not a one-time process right so you would have to run the machine learning process again and again because whatever data you have taken as an input and imagine that today you have done this entire process you have created a machine learning model you took like uh, almost one year worth of data and then you have created all these processes but what happened after say one month two months the data might change the data might be changing and you might have to retrain your machine learning model. If you don't retrain your machine learning model, uh, your front end models, whatever you are deployed, they might be giving wrong results because the data might have changed. So you also have to automate this machine learning process also. So generally what we do is we try to identify something called as data drift and model drift. Data drift is like change in the data. Model drift is the change in the accuracy of your models uh, based on different other parameters. Maybe the model uh, accuracy is changing over time uh, or maybe, you know, help with the combination of data analysis, all those things are changing. So you might have to retrain your models at an equal intervals of time. Depending upon the complexity of your model, you will be retraining the models maybe once in a week or maybe once in a month. So what happens is imagine today you have trained the model, created this entire system. Maybe after a week, every Sunday, every Sunday morning, nine o'clock, you will again retrain the model. You will load new data. You will do new transformation. You do new exploratory data analysis uh, and uh, that will create a new machine learning model, retrain it uh, as an iterative process 
create a new output model, right? So the new output model, whatever you create, that will be loaded back to your, you know, front end systems, also to your back systems, right? So that uh, are you getting understanding? So this has to be done as an iterative process because the data can change today. Whatever data is there, imagine you are applying the bank data for age groups of 35 to 45. If you consider 10 years back, uh, people who are applying for bank loans for housing loans uh, used to be people who are already in the middle age groups. They were, you know, working in some government companies or some private jobs or something. After they have gone through some years of savings, they used to, uh, you know, plan for their uh, new home. Right. You would also see that some people who are also, you know, almost 50 years of age at that time, they will keep on doing the saving and then they start for uh, building a house or construction of a house or an apartment and so on. But nowadays, the age group uh, you you have seen a change in that. You know, if you if a person is uh, already settled in a job, he got a job in some some company a uh, couple of years later, like say if the age group is somewhere around 25 to 28 he or she will be planning for a house, right? He might be taking some house somewhere else. So the, the trend has changed. What I'm trying to say is the trend will be changing every, you know, the change in the trend can be very rapid. It could be, you know, use of application, use of data, um, the change in the thought process. A lot of those things can be creeping in in the data so that depending upon the change in the data, underlying data, we might have to change the frequency of the machine learning algorithm the training of the machine learning algorithm so if the change is very rapid so that uh, you know we are getting new new people uh, and uh, new customers new age groups uh, and so on then what we do is you are you increment you increase the uh, training ability so you're trying to increase your training ability you will do very very fast um, uh, process and um, and that will be done uh, that, that will be like incre increasing the frequency of your um, training models so that uh, every day you might plan for every day training model so every day model will be trained a new model will be deployed both at the front end and also at the batch process side right are we understanding guys uh, having any questions here Is it is it clear or is it uh, you know a little overwhelming for you? Request everybody to go on mute, please. All right. So if if, uh, if there will be questions regarding like, for example, I am from a data warehousing background. Where do I fit? OK, there will be questions like that. Some people who will be from a Java background. Where do I fit? And some people who will be from a testing background. Where do I fit? Right. So this, as you see, it's a very huge ecosystem. If you are having uh, you have you have to have a very clear cut plan of what you want to do and where you want to fit in like if you are from a testing background and if you do not have a complete um, you know understanding of uh, a lot of um, processes and so on and so forth you don't want to do a full fledged programming right so you want to fit into an area where you can slowly uh, come into the entire ecosystem so good application good place to get into that area is like the machine learning engineer right so you would be uh, understanding about some of these tools linux bad jobs or maybe uh, something like flask or you know python something like docker and so on so you get in this space where you will be doing some part of machine learning so you'll be doing some part of the algorithmic process and you know like how the models will be created how they will be deployed and all that stuff and then you will be working in this space 
right? So I would suggest to somebody who is uh, entering into from a testing background or from a non-technical background, post target on this area, right? So area where you are implementing. So the job role you have to target is the machine learning engineer job role, right? So you'll be knowing some of the algorithms. Now you need to know uh, the basics. You need to know like how the algorithms will be, what the tools will be, applications will be. But the job role you'll be targeting is this part. And as somebody who is uh, uh, who has already has an understanding of programming, right? So programming in sense, he might already done some Java programming, C sharp programming, or C plus plus programming, or any other programming, right? To that matter, he all has already have an understanding of the programming, and he has interest in the data science part. Then he can venture as a junior data scientist or a senior data scientist right so he will be having a good understanding of this part where he can use some of the tools he can do the eda part he can do machine learning part create new models create new applications so he can become a data scientist and if he is also having interest in the deployment or uh, devops components and all he can learn something like docker git and uh, you know maybe uh, maybe like jenkins and so on and then he can venture as data scientist plus ml engineer that role somebody who is having a front end uh, um, knowledge right again people who are having front end knowledge who has done web based applications and so on the easy way to approach the there is becoming an ml engineer right how somebody who is having an understanding of this who can build these api endpoints for the models and so we are coming from this path right we are not going directly into the batch process or doing exploratory data analysis that becomes a little difficult so you have to come from this path you need to understand like how the models can be embedded how you can create apis how we can create flask based applications how we can use docker git uh, devops and ml right so you are venturing through this path you need to know this part you might be working as a uh, you know front end angular or react or java developer and you also have to develop here so when you are building your profile you have to build in this way so you are initially working as a java developer then you ventured as an ml engineer then you ventured as a machine learning then you came into the data science and then you did all this process so when you create your path in that way when you create your learning path or maybe transition path in that way it becomes very very easy somebody who is already in reporting for example there could be data warehousing reporting pure you know basic uh, reporting like it could be sap or um, you know any other uh, reporting like crystal reports or any kind of bi reporting the, for them you know getting into this area becomes very easy and understanding machine learning availabilities of the models and then doing the reporting of that it becomes very easy and slowly they can venture into the internal areas of machine learning and do the processing so people who are in the data warehousing background or in the data area for example they they might be dbas uh, they might be you know oracle or some other tables or they might be knowing some databases and they might be working on some uh, table related thing probably table related testing also right for them you know getting into this area becomes very very easy so you could uh, you know develop uh, skill sets where you can use like scoop database transformations uh, you know transformations regarding building queries reports graphs joins uh, you might also venture in uh, creating data lakes you might learn one of the tool like aws or something and then you can build your uh, skill sets here and uh, and understanding uh, exploratory data analysis at the later part and then the machine learning so your journey should be like this okay so your front end engineer journey will be like this uh, your back end engineers maybe database experts or something like that their journey will be like this somebody who is already working in data warehousing like uh, informatica or cognos or any other bi reporting tools right so those all people will be exactly fitting in this particular bucket so you might be need to have a little understanding on say like uh, you know maybe like the data systems where we are creating data lakes uh, how do uh, AWS S3, Azure Blob Storage, uh, GCP Cloud Storage, those all things, understanding all those things will give a very good edge uh, in getting some jobs, right? Now, the question comes is like, you know, if it is a small startup company, which areas to be tar targeting? If it is a medium company, which areas to be targeting? If it is a large 
product based company or a large it service company which areas to target that is also a big question so because if you are talking about a small startup company you become all mixed fruit juice right a, a guy who is working in a small startup company he has to know the data engineering he has to know the data science he would be doing the front end applications he would be doing the visualization he might have to set up a batch process so he or she might need to know uh, all of these technologies right you agree with me or not so you work as a startup company you have great amount of experience you will get a great amount of exposure but the problem is you would need to learn uh, all these technologies you might not be a master of everything but you have to become a jack of all these tools understood and that is a very very hard truth so a mid a small to mid companies they might give good package they might give a good uh, salary increments and all of that but keep in mind that your expectation is that you might have to know all these different dots you might be able to connect all the dots you should be ready like you you should be like this bahubali guy who is ready for the war uh, you should be ready to work on any of these technologies at any point in time coming to a bigger product company or maybe a service based company there will be easily predefined roles for example if you are looking at a service based company they will be having individual roles which are built for the customers right so they might be having a, a role for a front end a data ingestion engineer who will be having an understanding of scoop flume kafka kinesis or maybe some file protocols and so on so he'd be doing only the ingestion part he will be taking care of data ingestion jobs he will be ensuring that those are running properly they are not not having any problem and so on that is the first part maybe you could also have an aws cloud based uh, engineer cloud developer who might be working on setting up the systems uh, creating data lakes uh, doing the data transformations and all that stuff so there will be one part there there will be soon senior and junior data scientists who would be working on the central part exploratory data analysis machine learning who will be working on those areas and uh, there will be individual front end uh, developers who will be knowing angular react and so on there will be machine learning engineers who will be interacting with uh, front end developers who will all be also be interacting with data scientists to create deployable machine learning models so that your front end system engineers can you know use that for for the purpose you will also have data data visualization engineers separate you will also have uh, batch processors uh, separate and so you are seeing depending upon the type of the job profile where you are targeting which company you are going what company you are targeting your your thought process should be very very clear right if you are targeting for a bigger company you are targeting for a bigger it company services company then you might have some leeway because you will have multiple roles created every role will have specific um, uh, uh, job scope so you might be doing that specific work but it will also have to require so if you know all other things then it will also give a very good edge in in understanding all those things in a great detail understanding um for um uh, just trying to think whatever points i want to talk yeah so any any questions in this i think I was able to let me look at so can we integrate ai in machine learning model ai and machine learning they are not different they are same um so machine learning i'm just giving the name now that could be ai machine learning deep learning everything you know is that that is that is the only one right it is not uh, it is not different now people make use of that different terms and try to fool people but ai machine learning deep learning all those things data science all those things are same things right the same things but looking from a different angle right we are trying to look at from a different angle but it is the same thing what we are trying to see is that box will do your predicted model that will be created but how that is used is what we are trying to see all right 
uh, I'm from front end, where do I fit? Uh, as I told, I think your path should be like this, right? From a front end perspective, you need to know about ML engineer part, then coming into the data science, right? You should focus on these parts. So, uh, so once you have to focus on, you know, understanding the ML parts, like tooling things, if you're very good in Java, then you can directly jump into this area. It doesn't matter. Again, it depends upon what level of comfort you have in the code language, right? So if you are good in Java, then you can directly jump. I know many people uh, whom I have trained and also who got jobs also. They were pure Java developers who had developed front-end things, but then later become data scientists by picking this path. So, um, so there's a question on any plan on the new batch. We are focusing, uh, currently I'm focusing on the training, but there is a focus for creating a batch for interested people. If you guys are interested, please get in touch with uh, the organizers. They will keep in touch with you. Uh, if you are uh, willing to uh, join a batch, uh, certainly you can let us know and uh, we will target to create a batch for you guys and we'll take it forward. So what should I learn uh, if I choose as an NLP engineer? It's a very good question. Again, NLP engineer comes into this particular bucket, right? So you can uh, machine learning uh, could also have a sub part like NLP, natural language processing. But in natural language processing, you might have to understand a lot of things like how this text data can be converted into uh, numerical numbers. There is a lot of processing like text analytics. You have um, Lemmatization, stemming, and multiple other things are there. So you might have to have good hands-on on language part for becoming an NLP engineer. Uh, you might have to good hands-on on Python uh, or um, any other language. For example, Java and Python are good in NLP. So if you know any of those languages, uh, then you can pick and choose that topic. Uh, you will be working in this particular area. There are a lot of uh, deep learning based NLP processes also, which are coming boom, booming up right now. So a uh, lot of deep learning models are coming up like Excelnet, BERT and multiple other models like transformers and so on. All those models are very, very good. But for that, you would need to uh, have an understanding of good understanding of um, machine learning processing or NLP processing, the language part. All right, any other questions? I will, I'm just thinking to uh, have a small break. Um, for the past one and a half hour, I'm <laughs> going in a fast paced mode. Please excuse me if, if, if I'm speaking very fast. Uh, I'm just going in my flow. So there's a question like, uh, I'm an MCA fresher working in a startup. Should I go for data science? How much time it would take for a data science? Uh, I would uh, say roughly around three months is the required time. If you allocate at least one, one and a half hour every day, uh, my estimation would be three months is the time you would require to learn and master in one of the data science domains. So what I would uh, request is everybody has to have this focus on identifying their job profiles, identifying the companies who are picking up these uh, uh, engineers and so on. Um, so I stay in Hyderabad and there are plenty of job opportunities for data scientists. And there are many companies which I know are, um, you know, taking data scientists. Same is the case in Bangalore, Pune, uh, Noida. I'm talking about India. I can also talk about other parts of the world, but uh, certainly there are a lot of job opportunities for those people. So what you have to do is you have to focus upon what are your application uh, areas, what you're working on, what industry areas you want to go to, uh, which companies are op uh, offering the job, and then you have to target them. And uh, I would also talk about a lot of other things like uh, focusing on building your inbound capabilities of uh, getting a job. 
so we always go in an outbound approach. So I, I talk about the psychology of getting more inbound requests than outbound requests. So outbound request is more like uh, you are approaching for a job, uh, job, like you are putting your job application, you are doing all those things. That is a regular process. And in that, you would be having a lot of hurdles. You have to go to walk-ins, you might have to go to job interviews. There will be a lot of people competing with you. So that is a very painful process. Rather than that, we have to focus on inbound approach. For an inbound approach, people say that that would not work, but I would not agree with that. Inbound approach in sense, we have to create a platform in such a way that every people are looking at us, right? So can we create a, a lot of projects? Can we create a, a good LinkedIn profile? Can we project our projects in the LinkedIn profile? Can we participate in social platforms? So all these things are very, very important. And, uh, uh, you know, don't take me wrong that many people don't do that, right? Everybody is looking for a job, go to Naukri, go to monster.com, go to indeed.com, upload their profile and pray to God that I will get a call. That does not happen because there are plenty of job resumes which are floating around. What we have to do is we have to take actionable, uh, you know, steps in which we are trying to project our expertise, trying to build a GitHub profile, trying to do a lot of projects in whatever time we can get. So if I'm dedicating like three months for data science, ensure that you have to do as many projects as you can, trying to project them on LinkedIn, try to connect with a lot of LinkedIn contacts, maybe recruiters, maybe data science expertise professionals uh, who are in the space. And what you would see is, uh, within few uh, months, you would be getting inbound requests. So what are these inbound requests? People will flood to your LinkedIn profile saying that, you know, we have this job opportunity. Would you uh, like to come and, you know, work for us? But that is the stage we want to get to. Right? Now, how do we get to that stage is like, if you are able to contribute uh, to the entire social community, you are able to do some projects, you are able to showcase that, you know, you don't have to be very good in, you know, writing uh, good English uh, blogs and so on. That is not the expectation. What we are trying to do is we are trying to write some new experiments, trying to do some codes, put your GitHub links and so that so that the visibility of your uh, uh, profile increases. Of course, you would be also be trying outbound approach like you will be uh, putting your resumes on other profiles, other platforms and so on. That is one approach. But this inbound approach certainly works and I have uh, seen many people have created wonders my past students uh, to which I have spoken that you know target on your companies create an inbound uh, approach and then try to build your profile try to build your projects try to build your github uh, source and then what happens is it has plenty of uh, job requirements which are pouring in because people re really wanted people uh, um, to work for them and if I'm creating uh, uh, people who are quality people, right, who know how to do things, then it will be very easy for the recruiters to pick pick those people, right? So instead of like searching 100 profiles, sorting them out, interviewing them, finally coming to one person who is doing good in that, rather than that, go to this inbound approach, identify persons who are already working in that space, try to target them, ensure that if they want to come to the company. And that works very, very well. Right? Uh, are you understanding what I'm saying? So that is a pure targeted uh, methodology we need to follow or else, you know, what happens is you get into the crowd mentality, like, you know, you put into naukri.com and other stuff and then uh, you, you pray to God that, you know, I get call and <laughs> which doesn't happen. Right? And now we have to be extra careful because we are in a situation where everybody are tightening up, right? If you see any company, right, they are not getting new clients, they're not getting continued business. Uh, many of the primary businesses are stopped, like airlines, tourism, transport, travel, all these things are stopped and everybody will be very cautious in, uh, you know, expanding uh, additional spending unless until they're really required. So you need to be on the toes if at all you are in the job search or you are probably completing your engineering or you already uh, gone through like a couple of years of experience and now you want to shift. So the plan should be really solid. Plan A, plan B, plan C, you should be really, really solid so that you know you can uh, exactly pitch into the right space. 
so uh, there is a question that how to avoid confusion in choosing data science in aws uh, see i would say i would my my thought process is to have a t based approach okay so what is the t based approach and and this is very very important guys so your data science becomes data science becomes your depth okay so you have to have depth in 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 if you are wanting to get into this particular area you have to have the depth of the data science you have to have breadth of your cloud and devops now if you have this combination right and the breadth of technologies you don't have to have mastery in it you have to have mastery in the depth of technologies and in breadth of technologies you should have uh, you know understanding or basic knowledge okay so if you have understanding on cloud now that this could be any cloud you can take aws or azure or anything on devops like jenkins or uh, docker or git and um, kubernetes these are all some of the tools here so if you have understanding of cloud and devops this is the breadth i can call it as breadth and the depth if you are having in data science this is a sure shot formula for success this is a very deadly combination okay many people do not have this deadly combination they only focus on data science data and data science. stop here but then when it comes to the real world application when it comes to uh, uh, real um, jobs they will try to have a problem because they have to interact with people like where the model get deployed where the uh, analysis will happen where the files will be coming from so all that is cloud nowadays and how to do the deployment what all tools to be required those are all devops now if you're focusing on front end right say so you have to have depth in front end like any of these breadth should be in cloud and devops so this is very secret formula i would say it's very very important for anybody who's focusing on any uh, futuristic things and we are here that i'm very confidently saying cloud and devops are here to stay and your prime technologies like data science uh, any front end stack and all those things will be there for many many years to come but these are uh, kind of breadth courses like breadth uh, what i mean to say the the connecting dots those you need to have So there is a question like how do you differentiate classes that people are coming from different sectors so generally the classes might not be different because everybody have a, a different learning speed and learning pace so generally classes will have a specific flow because the classes should have a base on python have an understanding on python and then getting on to understanding different technologies and so on so uh, i will maybe after the break i will try to show you the curriculum right so if you are interested um, i will try to spend maybe like 10 15 minutes on the curriculum to show like how is the flow so that anybody whether that person is from a front end background database background or any other different sector he or she will be uh, having a clear cut flow in understanding all these topics okay so if you guys are interested i'll just walk you through those uh, topics for some time um so there is a question like how can i write a code for an uav i think i'm hoping that it is unarmed vehicle to detect uh, fire end or foe and other applications so basically this is uh, in the areas where we are using uh, computer vision and uh, so on so the technologies which we will be learning are called as deep learning so you can use deep learning based models for identifying all those things in fact uh, within the course we would also be doing a lot of um deep learning based uh, models deep learning based techniques in which we can learn about all those things so what is ocr i want to do a project on recipe generation with ocr uh, what is a good source so ocr is optical character recognition where 
you are trying to look at the text data or maybe image and then trying to identify what is in that image maybe like uh, looking at an image which is having some text and you're trying to extract the text imagine looking at a number plate and then trying to extract what is the number plate number right that is an example of ocr right you're trying to identify the text and then trying to look at that and identify what is there in the text and then using the application areas to apply on that that is what we call as ocr Got it. did i leave any questions uh, pardon me guys if i'm leaving any questions please post it again i'll be happy to answer so i'm working in a bpo industry I, is it possible to become a data scientist i know java basics web applications from where, where should i start to become a data scientist uh, so it doesn't matter whether you work in a bpo sector or any other sector you would be uh, you need to practice on um, understanding the language part first then getting into the basics of machine learning and then navigating to the other parts uh, so because you already know java and web applications your good point to start is this area so this particular area and uh, concentrate on this this area right um, like you you because you already have some java and front end experience you should con concentrate on this area how do you uh, use machine learning how do you become uh, do exploratory data analysis how do you understand flask python Git, docker and other stuff and that is the area you should concentrate on any certifications available in the data science yes there are certifications uh, available again there are cloud based certifications available so you can um, you can focus so but but your focus should be on learn learnability rather than certifications I know that people are very crazy about certifications, uh, but your focus should be on creating a lot of projects, uh, showcasing those projects. That is the key to getting any job. Like you can spend more twenty thousand, that is on forty thousand on certification. Uh, you know there are a couple of certifications which would say that uh, you know SIRAM is certified in data science and so on. But you know if your interviewer is not making any worth about it right and he would say like okay keep the certification aside tell me like how to do this and if you're not able to answer that then the certification is not not worth right so uh, what i want to uh, everybody understand is work on a lot of projects focus should be on doing real-time projects so that when you do real-time projects you get that experience and then once you get that experience you would be able to easily answer any of the questions answered by uh, questioned by your uh, interviewers all right what is the difference between data science and data prediction um data prediction data science see yesterday we were discussing about the data science and other stuff the application areas so so data prediction is nothing but your sub part of your data science like where we are trying to use data for doing any future predictions right which has not already happened so yesterday i was talking an example about you know in july i want to know like how many maruti cars will be sold right in uh, sorry july or a in august right if i say august july has already come right so august uh, i want to know how many cars will be sold maruti cars now i don't know how many will be sold so i have to do the prediction now using our machine learning models using a lot of data insights and all that stuff you could do the prediction now the question is how much the prediction is correct right so if you are saying that there will be 20000 cars will be sold but only 10000 cars are sold so you have that error margin of 10000 cars so how do you reduce that error margin so that your prediction is almost correct so we would use a lot of machine learning techniques for doing that uh, there are a lot of these techniques where we are ingesting a lot of different data points so that you get a very accurate result so all those things uh, will be involved in that so i would say data prediction is maybe like a subset of your entire data science process it's it's a piece in which we are trying to predict what is going to happen in the future all right so let me take a quick um, break here. 
Madam, can we take a quick break? Is there? Right. So we'll take a quick break. Let me go and have some water. I hope you are uh, liking the session, getting some insight. And please bear with my writing. <laughs> it's like it's like some chicken uh, this thing. Uh, I hope you understand like whatever I'm speaking and whatever I'm talking. Okay, so we'll take a break, and after I come back, I'll I'll show you the the curriculum, and uh, I will show you like whatever things are important. Okay, what are the things are important for you guys to uh, know or understand about this entire process? Like, what are the things you need to uh, learn? Okay, that part I'll talk about. What language to learn? What are the areas to focus on? And all those things we will discuss in uh, a great detail. So let me take a quick break. Um, we'll take a 10 minute break. Now it is what 746. Let me come back um, at, uh, at say 755 to 8 o'clock. All right. Thank you very much.
Um, so welcome back friends um, let me discuss about the other things which i was talking about uh, what are the various roles and hierarchy in data science space like data analyst to data scientist data evangelist okay so that is a totally different topic um, so if you look at the hierarchy of uh, data scientist or data analyst so basic one is data analyst or data analyst is the entry level job and uh, he or she will be knowing about excel and uh, some of the sql part doing some basic queries doing ba basic data analysis cre creating some basic reports okay so that is the work of your data analyst a basic job role after the data analyst you would have a uh, junior data scientist role where you would be uh, working on some of the basic exploratory data analysis part you would be doing some basic machine learning and so on and so forth the senior data analyst role will uh, be involving about more of the machine learning part statistical uh, processing maybe creating some new models uh, creating new business applications using these predictive models and so on so that would be your senior data scientist role and then uh, be, be above that you know your machine learning engineer will be again uh, above the data analyst role so a machine learning engineer would be of an experience range of like five to five to eight years of experience and he or she will be knowing about uh, the deployment process, Kubernetes, uh, you know, Docker, Flask, these all stuff, and they will be using uh, those tools for uh, performing those analysis. And uh, the other one, after the senior data scientist, you would also have a data architect. Now, data architect could be uh, understanding all these other things. For example, he will be understanding the data engineering stuff. He would be knowing the data ingestion part. Uh, data science part and also he will be knowing the deployment life cycle so all those things a data architect will be knowing uh, he or she might also have an understanding of cloud how do we deploy how do we use aws cloud or azure or gcp so data architect is a little above than the data scientist data scientists focus on only this part data architect focuses on all other uh, areas you would also have a uh, you know, solution architect or uh, uh, you would also have more, more, uh, uh, more uh, deeper uh, uh, job roles like enterprise architect, solution architect, depending upon how complicated is your application. Imagine your application is dealing with a lot of other uh, external stakeholders and a lot of other systems. Then you might require uh, somebody like an enterprise architect who would be understanding what are the different uh, uh, different data points to cover uh, where are, where which all places the data is coming from which all applications has to be touched or modified so all those things will be uh, uh, covered in 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 the data architect role and beyond that you would also have different uh, he uh, head roles maybe like a lead for data science lead data scientist or uh, you know data evangelist or data uh, data science practice head and things like that so there, there are some head roles who are like leading this entire data science teams so you might he or she might be leading some of the data scientists some data architects uh, some machine learning engineers and so on so such kind of roles will be there so if you look at this entire um, uh, uh, the hierarchy this is how your 
hierarchy will be there starting from basic data analyst then machine learning engineer junior data scientist senior data scientist uh, data architect solution architect uh, enterprise architect you know head data science like that this is how the roles will be depending upon different experience levels one or the other will be fitting into those different roles all right so let me talk about uh, the curriculum part <clears throat> so before the break i was just promising some of you that we will be discussing about this curriculum let me open it So the curriculum which I have designed uh, from my experience of understanding of what all important things to be there, uh, this is that curriculum. So it has 16 modules and uh, it primarily focuses on a lot of practical expertise on the data. So this should also give you like what are the important things you need to learn. Like doesn't matter whether you're learning here or somewhere else, but the focus is at least giving you an understanding of what are different things to learn and uh, those are the things we are discussing here so for foundations of the data science will give you a basic understanding of what are the important things which are there like what are the applications uh, how how is your entire end-to-end -end life cycle works what are the subtle differences between the uh, different uh, terms whatever we are learning like approaches of machine learning and different terminologies used in data science so whatever we have covered so far uh, comes under this particular area right we have understanding of all these things once we know all that stuff you have to get a good understanding on mathematics required for data science now again i would say this is a very under uh, you know under thought or you know under defined things like people people say that math math is not required right so but that is not at all true math for data science is very very important to understanding the in, inter, uh, intermediate uh, algorithms which are used for data processing and so on so linear algebra matrices matrix operation eigenvalues eigenvector scalars vectors and tensors different probabilities conditional probabilities prior and posterior probabilities uh, calculus, differentiation, gradients, cost function. See, all these topics we already have done in our schooling or plus one, plus two, that time frame, uh, you know, intermediate that area. But back in those days, we were just mugging up some formulas and saying d by dx of x square is equals to 2x. So you're just mugging up the formulas and then just uh, using that for some entrance exam or, uh, you know, passing some of your uh, board exams but uh, the real application of all those things uh, comes when whenever we are using data science so all these topics like how do we use differentiation why would i calculate d by dx of x square and what is that contributing to uh, the overall uh, thought of uh, creating an algorithm so all those things are really important um, so how do you do matrix operations why do we do matrix operations all those things uh, need to be understood to have a very strong foundation on on your data science part so these are the topics which will be covered in that area so math for data science is very important once you understand math for data science we need to get into something called as statistics for data science now statistics is also linked to mathematics we have to understand the statistical part of your data science because data is all about uh, understanding the patterns of your uh, what data is trying to talk so there are two major types of statistics one is called as descriptive statistics and then second one is called as inferential statistics now descriptive statistics talks about what it is already there so you already have some data process being done whatever is already there we are trying to understand that things like what is the mean of your distribution where is your central points what is your mean median mode or different types of data points and uh, how is the dispersion that means that what is the spread of your data the different techniques like variance and standard deviation uh, we have to apply different things like range quartiles and interquartile ranges 
we have to understand the measures of shape for example skewness and kurtosis different uh, correlations and uh, causation uh, techniques will be used we have to understand about different distributions for example probability distribution standard normal distribution probability mass function probability distribution function your cumulative distribution see all these things are really important to understand how your data is represented this is used very well in our exploited data analysis we will understand different distributions how the data is represented how is it related all those things will be uh, need to be learned next another thing is called as inferential statistics where we want to understand about uh, you know how do we infer your greater um, uh, greater uh, uh, results for example we need to talk about uh, you know how these inferences are working uh, in re regular data science processing you can't work on the entire population for example you want to release the drug for covid uh, release the vaccine for covid you can certainly you cannot work on every covid patient out there in the market because you uh, you have to test something you have to try some samples on some of the uh, covid patients ensure that it is working on those patients and then extrapolate the results to everybody else so whichever uh, drug companies which are trying to uh, bring vaccine or drug for covid they are trying to appro uh, pr use the same approach so there are different sampling techniques for doing inference there are different hypothesis testing there is null and hi alternate hypothesis there are different types of errors which are getting while we are doing this hypothesis testing so understanding those things there are different types of tests for example chi square test t test analysis of variance all those things are important for understanding these statistical parts so once we understand all those things we will be able to create a very good sound test criteria which says that okay if i take this random sample which is a clear approximation of whatever the actual population is we take that sample and then apply these different test values so that you can get better output results so that is uh, one other important area which needs to be understood so the focus on the primary section is understanding the foundations of mathematics understanding the foundation of statistics to have a very solid base for understanding data science because data science is all about applying these techniques in real world but once we know all that stuff we can get into python for data science uh, numpy pandas matplotlib seaborn these are some of the uh, jupyter notebook these are some of the uh, tools these are the toolkit now the toolkit which is used for doing a regular day to day data science job we need to understand all these things like numpy pandas matplotlib seaborn so once you have an understanding of numpy you know how do you do data operations with numpy how do you do numerical operations with numpy and uh, matrix related operations how do you uh, perform some statistical operations all those things you would use numpy next you would understand about something called as pandas pandas is another very very important tool it is also called as swiss army knife of your python world so you can use it is like a all purpose tool for doing everything like from data frame operations we are trying to do some selection slicing some descriptive statistics we can do some apply uh, joins uh, group by functions you can do indexing so you name it everything whatever we are trying to do uh, with uh, your database tables and maybe like excel sheets like selection sub selection all those things can be done by this tool pandas very powerful tool in the data science pipeline so we have to do a lot of work on this particular stuff there are visualizations we understood that visualizations are important uh, in your exploratory data analysis and also in the end so you might have to learn something called as matplotlib and seaborn for creating different visualizations different graphs histograms scatter plots line plots so all those different plots could be used for creating uh, understanding on the visualizations which are uh, used we also need to understand about uh, seaborn another library which is again used for creating some box plot violin plot swarm plots these are all different types of plots which are again helping in creating some visualizations now once i understand about visualizations we will combine all these techniques to apply into our exploited data analysis the exploited data analysis covers about a lot of different things like different pipeline ideas uh, you would know like how do you do data acquisition how do you do data preparation for example cleaning visualization some plotting 
and uh, you would need to know something like model planning model building all those things which are required for your entire data science pipeline you would know all those things here you would also need to know like how do you do data inputting like how do you read files from a csv text file json all those things and then how do you do data preparation you might need to know about what is transformation what is rescaling how do you do standardizing normalizing binary binary uh, processing encoding and inputting all these things are different things which are doing data processing we discussed in our previous diagram that eda or exploratory data analysis is that part where we do all these data pre-processing to understand all the techniques those all things are required so then we get into the machine learning part where we'll understand about different applications of machine learning you know supervised uh, machine learning classification and regression then we understand about different uh, other techniques of machine learning unsupervised machine learning reinforcement learning your know, model representation model evaluation uh, understanding of different estimation models and so on all those things need to be understood so we also need to know like how to do a general deployment strategy of machine learning models those all things have to be covered next part uh, you would need to understand about uh, supervised machine learning this is like the sub area classification in classification itself there are close to 15 uh, 10 to 15 models are there so you need to understand at least the basic models at least somewhere around uh, six to eight models you need to understand k nearest neighbors decision trees name base stochastic gradient distance support vector machine random forest xc boost logistic regression these are all models are very very important uh, these are used in the real world apart from these there are other models which are very basic models which we don't really use in the real world so it it becomes important for us to target on the important models which are uh, important to know for all these uh, things uh, you would also uh, know about different ensemble techniques, for example, different combining models. There are something called as backing and boosting techniques and voting techniques. You have to uh, combine multiple models and create more powerful models. For that, we need to understand what are the different ensemble methods to understand that. We also need to understand about uh, model tuning. Model tuning is, a, is an area in which we are trying to improve the accuracy of the model. So you apply different techniques like train test splitting, k-fold cross-validation, variance bias, straight off, applying some norms like L1, L2 norms, and doing hyperparameter tuning. All those things are applied to improve your accuracy of your model. So you are trying to apply this machine learning modeling. You get like 72% accuracy. You want to increase that accuracy so from 72 to say like 85 or 90 or something. Uh, you want to do all these techniques one or one or more of these techniques to get uh, a better uh, you know understanding once that is done you would get into something called a supervised machine learning regression a regression is another technique where we are trying to predict uh, continuous values for example stock prices profit of a company number of cars so these are all coming under regression quantities so regression predictions uh, there are different regression techniques like linear regression, uh, variants of regression like lasso and ridge regression, multilinear regression, logistic regression models, polynomial regression models, random forest and support vector regression. Different regression techniques are there which also need to be understood for doing some uh, continuous value predictions. There are different uh, performance measures like understanding how good the regression models are. For example, the common one is RMSE. Uh, mean absolute error mean square error these are different techniques for doing uh, performance analysis of your regression models after that you get into something called as unsupervised machine learning unsupervised machine learning we apply a lot of machine learning tools like k-means clustering hierarchical clustering db scan uh, and we also do other techniques like association rule mining market basket analysis using a priori algorithm dimensionality reduction using principal component analysis so all these different techniques will be used for um, these are unsupervised machine learning techniques with uh, which are used for um, you know doing a lot of unsupervised processing next we'll get into natural language processing again natural language processing it itself is a very very big area but we will be understanding like what are the different text analytic processing, stemming, lemmatization, stop word removal, points, pause tagging, name entity recognition, bigrams, n-grams, 
how to create term document metrics, how to use count vectorizer, how to create TFID vectorizer, and how to create applications using natural language processing. All those things will be uh, will need to be discussed. So the next one is uh, uh, is like advanced analytics. So advanced analytics, uh, we will cover about time series analysis, ARIMA models, uh, content-based recommender systems, collaborative filtering, and these are different techniques which are used for um, you know different uh, systems, recommended systems. And once these uh, these are some advanced topics to understand in advanced analytics. Then we'll understand about recommend reinforcement learning. Again, these are basics of reinforcement learning. A lot of applications will be in the space of supervised machine learning and unsupervised machine learning. Reinforced machine learning is uh, reinforcement learning is picking up right now in, in the research area. But here we'll understand what are the different techniques. For example, action and reward based mechanism. How do we apply penalty based mechanism? How do you create feedback loop in reinforcement learning? All those things we'll be covering here. Then we'll get into the artificial intelligence part, focusing on neural networks, perceptron learning, feed forward network, back propagation, some of the different techniques which are applied in artificial intelligence. Those things need to be understood. We would be understanding about mathematics required for artificial neural networks. Uh, how do we create gradients? What is gradient descent? How do we use your partial derivatives, uh, applications of linear algebra, creating your eigenvectors and projections? All those things need to be understood here. There are some tools like TensorFlow and Keras and PyTorch. Those are the ones which will be used. Then we will be getting into the real deep learning topic, which is actual use of artificial intelligence. Uh, we'll be understanding TensorFlow and Keras installation. How do you uh, create your hypothesis function using uh, your TensorFlow models? How do you do optimization basis? Uh, create some applications using neural networks. All those things will be done, like multilinear perceptrons will be understood here. And uh, then we get into convolutional neural networks. This is where your image processing, video analytics, all those things will be coming up. We will be understanding about the architecture of CNNs, uh, different types of convolutional neural network models. How do you build an image-based classifier using CNN? All those things will be understood here. Then we will be also be focusing on recurrent neural networks. The recurrent neural networks talks about uh, you know time series forecasting, uh, you know maybe stock market prediction. All those things will be understood here like how do we use uh, you know how do we create chatbots like you have to create chatbots uh, we can use recurrent neural networks for creating those chatbots and last but not the least i was focusing on a lot of cloud computing right so cloud computing is very very must uh, we would need to understand about uh, so i have a great expertise in aws so i'll be focusing on aws like how do you create uh, cloud based applications on aws how do you create machine learning models on aws what are the AWS preliminaries like S3, EC2, RDS? How do you do big data processing on AWS? How do you do machine learning using Amazon SageMaker, deep learning using AWS Cloud? How do you do natural language processing using Amazon Lex? Uh, so these are all some of the uh, different AWS concepts, cloud-based concepts for applying end-to-end -end machine learning processing. So we'll create uh, projects. So that project will be deployed on AWS. So you can have a web address www.myproject.com like that and that will open up your project you could also show it for your content uh, you know interviewers for uh, for any job profiles and last but not the least the devops part the devops is also very important it is the process of understanding this entire uh, deployment pipeline of your uh, you know machine learning models how do you deploy that into production how do you deploy the models as services how do you create end-to-end uh, -end APIs, uh, REST APIs of your machine learning models? How do you run your machine learning models on containers? How do you scale up using Kubernetes, Docker, and so on? All those things need to be learned here. Right? But without that, it would be, it would not be fulfilled. So it total covers about 16 modules, and 16 modules are very, very, um, you know, jam-packed sessions. A total duration will be three months and uh, it, it really gives a very full-fledged uh, information uh, it will cover close to 20 projects so i'd be covering close to 20 projects uh, talking about uh, right from very very basic projects to advanced projects so i've also listed some of the projects 
For example, you would create an XML to CSV converter using basic Python. This is to brush up your knowledge. Then you'll be creating a photo editor from scratch using Flask and NumPy. This will help us how to create Flask based front end applications. So it is using Python and Flask to create end to end photo editor as if like I am, you know, uploading a photo, uh, creating a cropped, cropped image, converting a color image to black and white like that. All those functionalities will be done here. Then we would be learning about exploited data analysis on retail shops, shop sales data. We'd be using retail uh, data analysis, data pre-processing, all the scaling techniques, whatever we are discussing will be discussed here. Then we'll be learning K nearest uh, neighbors algorithm using fruit prediction data. Uh, then we will be getting into predict malignancy of mammogram masses using decision tree classifier. We will be knowing uh, predict uh, whether a candidate will be sh shortlisted in H1B visa process using random forest algorithm um, and predict breast cancer using support vector machine algorithm. This is another machine. Uh, HR analytics for attrition prediction using logistic regression. This is another project and uh, churn analytics in telecommunication domain. This is another project predicting house prices using regression, uh, social media ad prediction using uh, using regression prediction, uh, retail customer segmentation based on spending patterns. This is most of clustering techniques, different clustering techniques which are used. Market basket analysis using a priori algorithm. So this is like identifying uh, association between the products so you can uh, identify similar products and so on. SMS spam detection using natural language processing. This is a spam detection classifier using NLP. And uh, then sentiment analysis on restaurant use, restaurant reviews using natural language processing. This is another NLP project uh, using natural language processing. Uh, image classifications using deep learning. This is where we are trying to identify images using CNNs, identifying faces, uh, projects, helmets, and things like that. All those things will be used uh, here. Then we will be doing content based recommender systems using deep learning another very interesting project uh, chatbots using recurrent neural network will be creating an end to end live generative chatbot which can talk as if like a human is talking to us. So we will be knowing like how to create chatbots using deep learning and uh, stock market prediction. This is also a very interesting project where we can use uh, RNNs and LSTM models to do real time stock predictions. You know, it will not be so accurate so that you can bet on it, but definitely it gives uh, above 85% accuracy uh, in stock market price movements and so on. And uh, exploited data analysis on crime data using Boston analysis. So all in all, there are close to 20 projects. Uh, these are minimum projects. We will be doing more than this. Apart from this, there will be two capstone projects which will be done as a part of the course. So, so I just wanted to give you a brush up of all the things which are required. So this is my focus area. So I want to keep it very, very uh, jam packed and very, very practical oriented uh, thing. So I just uh, wanted to walk you through how this should be done. Now it doesn't matter that you know you are doing this or not, but at least it should give you an understanding that these are very, very important. These are the areas which are important focus areas. So that uh, whenever you are doing some learning, you could do it, uh, you know, any way. But you are doing that learning, you should ensure that these focus areas are covered. Okay. So if you're covered, if you're doing enough practice, if you're doing a lot of projects, if you're seeing all these projects, will definitely give you an edge on many other people who have not done these things, right? So you should have that confidence level. You should have that uh, focus that you know you're doing these projects, getting that understanding, and then. And then using this expertise, you can pitch into the next role, whether that can be within your organization or maybe you're trying for a different job switch or something like that. Um, it, it could be used very well. Got it? Understanding? Are you guys any questions on whatever I have discussed? Are you getting some idea here? Any other questions you had, please let me know. We'll we'll take some few minutes to answer those questions. So I see there is a question that I had a gap of four years from starting. How 
can I proceed in cracking a job as I was as it was a booming course so as I was talking about cracking a job you need to be very hands-on so please focus at least one two months couple of months doing a lot of hands-on practice uh, choose the particular area which is of our, in, your interest for example data science is a booming area but it should uh, if you are if you are interested in that then choose that area and then try to learn all these nitty gritty details so that you can get all these practice and then when you do a lot of projects you will get that confidence and then you can approach uh, different perspective interviewers about your uh, thing so there will because that gap whatever is there people will certainly ask like why the gap is so you should be able to justify that gap uh, maybe you are trying something you you know you're trying some other kind of jobs and so on so those all things you should be able to properly uh, answer but once you're able to answer and if you have the relevant skill set uh, people are definitely going to give a job yeah that, that's how it works um, should I learn UI tools being a machine learning engineer? It's not a requirement mandatory. Machine learning engineer focuses on data science related models and deployment of the models. UI engineer is, it's not a requirement, right? If it is a small startup, then you might need to know that. But as a general thing, if you if you have seen our, um, this thing, right? If you go back here, machine learning engineer will be focusing on the deployment part of the models like either it is a batch process or a ui based things he would be knowing like how to create apis rest apis using class based applications how do you do deploy how do you do docker based deployments uh, how do you train the machine learning models how do you ensure that uh, uh, every day that machine learning model is trained and automatically the model is being put into uh, a ui server Right, all those things will be done by your ML engineer, but it is not a requirement that he or she needs to know Angular or uh, React or any other front-end tools. That is not a requirement. It is a good to have. Right. Any other questions? So there is a question on what is Pi Carrot. See, those are very specific packages. Pi Carrot, if you know, in R there is a package called as Carrot, uh, which is used for doing a lot of uh, statistical uh, uh, over uh, statistical modeling. So PyCarrot is an extension of the same functionalities on the Python side. So anyway, we so those are very, very specific stuff. So the questions you're asking is very, very specific stuff. Uh, so that would come as a, a specific thing whenever we are doing a specific tool and so on, right? All right, so I hope you are liking the session. Uh, if you wish to continue, uh, if you wish to learn from us, uh, so I'd be soon starting a course on this. Uh, the course would be uh, roughly around two and a half to three months duration course. Uh, it would be like a daily class every day uh, morning. It would be uh, our time, maybe like six o'clock to seven o'clock uh, IST, six o'clock to seven o'clock IST so that if even people are working professional so that they can just get the class done and then they can start their day uh, so that's the timing which we have chosen and if the people are from different parts of the world for example people from uh, us and other people other areas they can also be uh, using the time so that is the focus area so if you are interested uh, you can just contact uh, our team they will be uh, getting in touch with you if you are uh, if you're interested in learning course from my side, uh, data science, and I'll be very happy to uh, talk to you again. Uh, but uh, if not, that is also great. You know, very good luck for your uh, future, but keep these points in mind. These are very, very important. Uh, we have covered a very good uh, overview of what all things are required. 
So keep these points in mind and try to uh, carve your path. There is, uh, there is a lot of scope in learning all these tools and getting a better job uh, than whatever you're doing right now. All right, I hope that is good. Uh, if you have any questions, I'll wait for a few minutes or else we will close the session. Uh, please let me know your feedback. Uh, if you are liking the session or something needs to be improved, I'll use this all, uh, all, all your feedbacks for improving myself. So will there be only one instructor for all these? Yes, I will be the only instructor who will be teaching all these things right from start till the end. So which domains may have uh, data science jobs uh, in 2021? Uh, it's a right good question. I would uh, I would focus on the applications like healthcare is one of the primary area which has a lot of jobs right now in data science. Uh, we have finance domain. Uh, some of the banking companies are having jobs. Uh, then you can say like some telecommunication companies are having jobs. So all those things are focus areas but if you want me to talk about two primary areas healthcare and finance these are the two areas finance and banking these are the two areas which are having a lot of opportunities is there any prerequisite for joining the course uh, there is no prerequisite um, you would need to have a basic understanding of some language even if you don't have an understanding of language i'll be talking about python from a little basics. So uh, whoever do not have that understanding can you know, use that as a brush up course and then picking up as a, um, as a basic, right? So that is something which I can, which is required. All right, any other questions? How about experienced fellows without uh, domain knowledge, uh, how companies will take it? Um, so what I would say is, you know, there are two requirements. First is the understanding of the domain part where, you know, it, it would require people need to understand what domain they are working in. Imagine you're applying for a banking domain. People expect that if you have some banking domain background, it is a plus for them, right? Rather than they, uh, creating a special uh, knowledge transfer session for you. Uh, you already have an understanding of how these processes work and so on. It becomes a good advantage, but that doesn't become a mandatory uh, every time. So what happens is even if you do not have a domain, uh, you can focus on the technology part and then crack the interview. But what I would suggest is uh, try to identify your current domain. You might be working on some or the other work, right? So if, if you are already having an experience, you might be working on some domain like retail or banking or something then focusing on those areas of how to use machine learning models for those application areas and then using that in in uh, in the using that experience in gaining confidence in the interviews so that is the focus point so if you are able to do that uh, it should definitely turn it around So practical sessions will be starting after three months are do uh, that is included as a part of the course. So it is it is a code oriented sessions. So it is not theory oriented sessions. It is code oriented sessions. That means that as and when we are understanding the uh, tool or a language or an algorithm, we will be doing the applications, right? So you'd be doing a project hands on. So it doesn't because if you learn algorithm after one month or uh, you are learn the algorithm right now and doing a project after three months you i am damn sure that you will forget everything okay i can write it on the paper so the the thought process is to learn algorithm as and as and when we are learning the algorithm you are applying that as a project right 
so that's how it goes it goes hands in hand hand in hand so that you can uh, you can get the learning uh, as a part of it can we mention hackathon projects in your cv definitely so if you participate in any of the hackathons like hackerat or kaggle.com there are a lot of these uh, online competitions available uh, the focus should be doing a lot of projects now wherever the projects are we have to target that so so mentioning hackathon projects definitely help you in your in your resume right it is an added plus not not everybody doing so just look around you like look around your friends look around your social circle just see what they are doing they are not doing all these things if you do that definitely you would get an edge you understand my point so my focus is on getting a lot of projects done whether that could be hackathons so my course students would participate in kaggle.com kaggle.com is one of the uh, top data science co competition and uh, you participate in either single uh, person as a group or as a group so once you participate uh, you would be participating in the competition winning the competition is not a criteria so doing the competition getting the understanding doing all the techniques whatever we are learning and then implementing in the real world is is the crux so once we do that we get a lot of confidence of doing projects and so on so like that it will give us the momentum of doing more projects or more projects you do you project that into the cd imagine you create a real project which is hosted on aws cloud and then you ask your interviewer to click that link that myproject.com and then the person clicks that link which has a real bank application for predicting uh, loan probability and so on and then you can ask him to give some details and then predict the ability of him getting a loan whether whether that will be cool or not and then you are explaining that how that project is working what you have done for the project what issues you have faced that will give a clear cut uh, winning uh, um, chance rather than other people who are coming from the same interview right so the focus is that doing projects projecting them in your uh, profile creating a brand linkedin profile so that people come to you rather than you going to the people right that is the focus all right okay so i think uh, we are good <clears throat> i don't see any other questions if you have any questions we can just wait for uh, two minutes and i'll close the session i hope you are liking it uh, i wish we can talk later some other time and uh, i hope you can join the class or join the course so till then take care guys and have a nice weekend ahead wherever you are and rest of the week uh, please take care of yourself uh, you know outside the places are not really good there's a lot of covid cases increasing uh, please do take care of your health and your family uh, be responsible wear masks and you know wash your hands okay take care have a nice day bye bye